going to spend some time today um, talking about open textbooks, learning about open textbooks. And um, so a little bit of background on these, you know, kind of my perspective on this. Um, my background is education. I'm the CIO in the College of Education at the University of Minnesota. I'm the director of the Center for Open Education, but um, uh, my, back, so I, but my background is education, curriculum and instruction. That's what my PhD is in. Anybody here? Education, curriculum and instruction, even? All right. All right. All right. So um, that's what this is about. And in a way, and, and my PhD is in learning technologies. You know, these learning technologists are the people who typically kind of get really excited about the newest technology and how it can be applied to. Uh, to learning, right, to help improve students' learning. I never really imagined when I got, got entered the field that I'd end up talking about textbooks, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think you'll see here today, I hope you do, that you'll see why, why it is that we're spending time um, talking about textbooks. Um, because it actually really isn't about textbooks, even though that's the title of this presentation today. It's really more about this. It's really more about access, access to higher education. Um, this is from the United Nations, right? The Declaration of Human Rights saying that higher education should, should be equally accessible to all. And, you know, when I first saw this years ago, in my very US-centric perspective, I'm thinking, oh, those poor people in other countries that don't have access to higher education. But as I got more involved in this project, realized that this is an issue here. Access to higher education is a big issue. This is a study done for the U.S. Department of Ed showing that in about the first decade or so of this century, there were about 2.4 million students who did not complete college because of cost. There were a lot more students who didn't complete college, but 2.4 million was, were attributed to cost and cost alone. So. And these are said, college qualified. In other words, they did all the right things. They took all the right classes in high school. They did well enough. They were kind of qualified to go to college, but because of cost, they didn't graduate. This is one piece of evidence in my mind showing that we have an access issue uh, here in the United States. Um, why is that? Has it always been true? Let's look, at, let's look at how things have changed. And I'm going to make the argument here. We're going to spend a little bit of time just defining the problem. Like what this, We're going to talk about open textbooks. We're going to spend about 20 minutes or so talking about why. Why are we even talking about this? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? This graph basically is, is, this graph is showing um, the two sources of funding in higher education, public higher education, our two main sources of funding, right, which are what? State funding and tuition, yeah. So the, the orange line there is state funding, and the blue line is tuition funding. So, you know, I graduated my undergrad somewhere around here. Go ahead and do the math. Um, and, you know, look at, the, look at the burden that was on me compared to the burden that was coming from our state. And then you move on to today, where they have kind of merged. And look at the, the load on a student has gone from about 3,000 to 6,000. This is all adjusted for inflation, by the way. So the load has doubled for students, right? In many states, including in Minnesota, that line crossed years, actually a few years ago. And mo in many states, it's crossed. This is US data here. Here's Texas. They're not close to crossing, which is good news. However, look at the load on students. It has more than doubled, hasn't it? It went from two to four to almost 5,000. Um, times are tough, right? And, the, and continually the burden kind of keeps kind of getting pushed onto the students. Is that per year? This is per year, right. Uh, it's all, you know, on average across the state. Is that for and two year colleges or just four year colleges? Both. Public institutions. Yeah. So, um, 
So if this is the case, like if things are different, which is what I'm trying to say, is things are a little different than they used to be. Maybe when you know when I graduated, or maybe when you graduated. What options do students have? If they need more money, they don't, you don't have a lot of options. You can loans, loans, right? There's a big one. You can also work, right? Work more. Anybody know students who have like a full time job? Yeah, at least one. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about working your way through school and how realistic that is nowadays. If you look back, this is this is University of Minnesota specific data here. The, the blue line shows the number of hours a student would need to work at a minimum wage job, which is a typical student job, to afford one year of tuition at the University of Minnesota. So it's the number of hours to afford a year of tuition. And if you look back here, 60s through the 80s, we're talking two to 400 hours. Do the math, 40 hours a week, that's maybe 10 weeks. Summer job, right? A 10 week job. So if anybody in here graduated back here, you might have been able to say, yeah, I you know, mostly worked my way through college or I you know, paid for a big chunk of your college. <laughs> Today, we're getting to be closer to, you know, a full-time job would be 2,080 hours, 52 weeks, 40 hours a week, 2,080 hours. We're getting closer to that. Now, I just updated it actually the other day, and it has dropped because the minimum wage in Minnesota went from 725 to 950. I believe the minimum wage in Texas is 725, am I right? Your tuition is actually a bit lower than Minnesota, so I actually, that little star right there is where you're at. Considering your full-time in-state tuition and the minimum wage in the state of Texas. That's how many hours it would take. I hope I did that right. Yes? Yes, there's one other uh, avenue, uh, which is that people drop out of community college and enlist in order to earn the GI Bill, right. in order to pay for a baccalaureate degree, and then find out that it doesn't fully cover it. Mm -hmm. Covers the GI about three Bill years out of four. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. okay. I didn't know. Yeah. Right, so there's another option for getting through the, getting through. So the point here is really that it's much more difficult than it used to be to work your way through school, right? And this, by the way, is only tuition we're talking about. This isn't room and board, this isn't books, this isn't anything else. This is just affordable tuition. Borrowing was the other avenue, right, we were saying. And about <coughs> two-thirds of our students borrow to make it through college. This now is the average that those borrowers come out with, about $30,000 in debt. In Texas, it's a little lower. Um, I actually think your tuition is a little lower on average than, than most states in your public institutions, from what I can tell. I don't know if anybody has it, knows that for sure. I see a lot of heads nodding. So um, the, the lending, borrowing money has become such a crisis that you heard it as part of the presidential campaign last year. You're seeing it in the news all the time, the student debt. You can basically um, look in the newspaper or watch TV just about, I would say, I would say two or three times a week you'll see stories on this about the, the low, the debt load of students. So th this graph basically shows um, the orange line is credit card debt, the blue line is student debt nationally. And you can see where the bubble happened, right, where the recession hit and people stopped borrowing quite as much, it flattened out. Um, when I started this project, these lines were just starting to cross, right in here. And so, the amazing thing to me about this is that this is only just 10 or 11 years ago, and it was at 500 billion, half a billion, and now we're at or over 1.3, it's almost tripled in just 10 or 11 years, student debt nationally. So again, that's why I think you've seen stories in the news all the time. In fact, I, when I woke up yesterday and saw this story, number of hungry and homeless students rises. I think at the community college level, the study, and this is from the University of Wisconsin, showed about 20% of students were regularly Hungry, I don't know how they define that exactly, and about 14% said so they were homeless. And we just learned this morning that you opened a food pantry here on campus just recently in the last couple months. Oh, where's that? 
It looks University like it's Center. in the University Center lower level. <laughs> so, so again, another sign of what's happening. Students are really struggling financially, right? And so that's kind of the impetus for this. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about students where, where finances, where, where, where money is getting in the way of their learning, right? It's limiting their access. And these are the, the general categories of um, expenses that students, these are actually defined by the federal government. Institutions are required to give estimates of these costs before students enroll. Um, if you go on to the web and just Google estimated cost of attendance uh, for UT Arlington, you can find what your institution estimates here. Right? Now, you know which one of these we're going to talk about, right? I think so. Um, we're back about that one right there, books and supplies. Now, is this the biggest one on the list? Right, not even close, is it? So I want to acknowledge that. I know we know that that is certainly the case. Why would we just talk about this one in this group? You can do something about it. In fact, you're the only ones who can do something about it. Faculty are the only ones who can change this. There's another one too. I would say that this cost has a particularly high impact on student success. And I'll show you that here in a minute. I mean, um, it's a little different. It's not quite as predictable. It's sometimes a surprise, whether you think it should be or not. It is sometimes a surprise. It's sometimes a surprise to students. At least the amount is a surprise. They don't know semester to semester what it's going to be. You can kind of count on these two, right? You know. Those are the big ones. So let's look at books, textbooks. This is data from the Consumer Price Index. Um, the blue line there is inflation, right? That's just the Consumer Price Index inflation. The orange line are textbook costs nationally. And there was a study done at the University of Michigan Flint by an economist, and I quote, textbook prices have all been going up at a much faster rate than any other consumer product, which to me was a surprise. I mean, I did, you know, healthcare, really, it's going to have faster tuition, it's going to go faster, you know, the things that you kind of just right away jump to when you think of the things getting really, really expensive, but textbooks are going up faster than any other consumer product. And so it has been going up about three or four times the rate of inflation. All right, so it's presented at that crisis. <laughs> the College Board says that students should budget about $1,300 a year for books and supplies because that is the, that's the federal category, but that's almost completely textbook counts. I'll mention that studies have shown that students don't actually spend $1,300 on books. Well, they're told they should budget it, but they don't actually spend that. Why do you think that is? Buying used books, trading with others, renting, renting them, or not, not buying them at all. Right? Anybody know students who just, are, just aren't buying them? Yeah, right? Um, your number that you estimate students should budget $1,206. So you're right in there. Right? You're right in kind of that average. That's what you're telling students on their website, what they should budget and for it. Right. Um, I have obviously not been an undergrad student for quite a while. Um, and I think it's important to kind of keep in mind, um, I, I want to make sure that this is about students. I want to make sure the voice of students are heard here today, um, even though I know you hear them every day. But um, about this topic, well, I did set up a, just kind of set up a camera on campus and <coughs> captured some students' thoughts. I have just about two, two or three videos like this. Um, so here's the first one. Just what do you think about the cost of textbooks? Uh-oh, I didn't test the sound. Always a mistake. <laughs> Give it a shot. Should it be going through the HDMI? No? I, I yeah, I'm the tech guy. Did I, did I mention that? 
and it says two. All right, so wait till pricing. Just feel like they're really overpriced. Really valuable, but the cost is just a little, little too much for students who are already paying a lot for tuition. Find a way to make costs more manageable because tuition's going up, everything's going up, cost of living's going up, and then textbooks are going up. There is definitely a value to them, but maybe not for the cost that we pay for them. I mean, I guess professors are trying to uh, provide students with books that are reasonable, but I mean, there are some textbooks that are just um, they're just way too pricey. I just feel like they're really overpriced. Yeah, I get frustrated when a, uh, you have to buy a book that's expensive that you don't use. Textbooks are only used for so long before you're done with them, so it's like you know, use it for a couple months and then. How we never touch it again? If people weren't just um, issuing new editions and just increasing prices, rather stick to what you have. It is kind of expensive, and sometimes I feel like I have to buy the textbook because um, it is required. But it does kind of suck to like throw away so much money on something that you only use for a semester. They, they should keep the same textbook for several years because the material doesn't change that much. I have purchased them and I don't use them, which is kind of frustrating. I think it's outrageous, actually. Um, yeah, it costs way too much in general, I think. So I don't think there was anything mind blowing there. Like, you hadn't heard that before, or kind of at least assumed students were thinking before. Um, but I think it's good to be just kind of be reminded of what's going through their heads in this. Now, I have three sons. Um, last year, all three of them were in college. Oh. Yeah. Uh, there's still two. One of them graduated. Um, and, um, you know, I, again, I, we knew this was coming. This wasn't a surprise that they were all going to be in college at the same time. We know for 18 years they were all going to be in college at the same time. And so we did our best to save, but when, when they went off, we said, you know, you know, if we're going to make it here, you really have to live like students. And how many students do you think are told that, right? You have to live like students. In fact, in Minnesota, there's actually a campaign that the university is telling them you need to live like students. Did you hear some things in that video that kind of m might make them question whether buying a textbook is the best value for their money? None of them said textbooks are stupid and they're not gonna help me in there. They, none of them said that. They all said, well, I understand they're valuable. However, right, they're so expensive that, um, it kind of, I can understand when I when I would talk to my sons, I'd say, beginning of the semester, I'd say, you know, hey, have you bought your textbooks yet? What do you think their response was? It's always kind of, well, right? I mean, you've seen students like that that just are hesitating. And they do, they buy them eventually, some of them, most of them, whatever. But it's usually, well, I'm gonna find out whether I really need them or not. Now that, in my mind, I tell my, my Sons, I'm like, no, just buy the darn thing. We'll figure it out. You need them. But I absolutely don't blame them for doing exactly what we asked them to do, which is, like, be careful with what you're spending your money on. And if they have an experience with a faculty member who had a $300 textbook that they only used two, two chapters out of, or, they, you know, those kinds of experiences that you heard in the video, I get why they make that judgment. I do, and I kind of appreciate it. At the same time, I'm telling them, no, you need to go buy the darn things. So... That's where we're at. We're at, a, we're at a place kind of where there's some tension there. And students are finding ways to um, make this work as best they can, right? Now, there are things that I heard earlier, like strategies that students, like, um, like bookstores are using. Like bookstores have been like on the front lines of this affordability thing for a long time. They're trying to figure out different programs to help students afford their books. You can rent them, you can buy digital versions, you can, what else, used, so on, right? That's all well and good. They're still rather expensive, unfortunately, and what's happening are students are finding ways to survive this, right? Here's what we're hearing from students, and I actually left one off the list, unfortunately. One, the first one here is, um, that I left off the list, is um, downloading copies that they find on the internet. Likely violating copyright law. So they're putting themselves at some legal risk there, right? Okay. 
And you can, by the way, find pretty much any textbook you want online. Just Google just Stuart Calculus, you know, like those standard calculus books. Just Google Stuart Calculus PDF, and you will, within two clicks, have that book if you really wanted to. So about a third of students say that they do, that that's exactly what they do. That's what research has shown. So these strategies are a little bit different. They're not putting themselves probably at any legal risk in any of these, but they're doing something a little different. Purchase an older edition, delay purchasing, like I was talking about with my sons, and there are other reasons too why students delay. Never purchase one and share it with others. That's one that's growing in my mind. I don't know if you've seen that, but in the last two years or so, more and more students are sharing. So I'll just quickly look at these and look at the impact they're having. <laughs> so buying an older edition. This was something a student told me a few years ago when he said he was asked to buy an $80 French textbook and he found one on Amazon that was like two editions older and it cost him eight bucks. And he said, that's what I could afford, so I bought it. And this was his rationalization, which I thought was pretty good, actually. Um, at the same time, in the next breath, he said that he understood he was taking a risk an academic risk, right? The readings are different and so on, the, the book's different. So he knew that, but he was willing to take that risk because that's what he could afford. So he's trying to find ways to get around this. Delaying. Now besides the, the story I told you earlier about my sons, which I think actually has become kind of the norm, in the rule, not the exception, that students are just kind of waiting, waiting it out to see what they will be. There are students who have to wait. Financial aid usually doesn't come in until after the drop deadline, like it's up three weeks in, something like that, right? The same is true for the GI Bill. There's a delay, there's paperwork and time that it takes. So these students may need to wait three weeks to get access to their course content. If there are problems they're supposed to be doing, if they have to find ways to deal with that. Sharing it. Um, uh, gave a workshop yesterday at uh, University of North Texas and one faculty member said that students will come in and just take pictures of their someone's textbook on their phone, right, and do that. Um, another short video, um, just asking questions, asking students this question here. Have you ever delayed purchasing a textbook? I usually wait until uh, I feel like there's a need in the class to buy the textbook, or if I'm falling behind mm -hmm. and I can't find another resource for free online, that. Um, would also give me that information, and then I'll buy a textbook. But I have delayed purchasing a textbook until it was completely necessary to have it. Yes, I have. Unfortunately, <laughs> I had some troubles because of it. Textbooks are obviously something that you really obviously need, and in order to do well in a class, you know, you need to have that textbook. And because it costs so much, I think a lot of people have problems getting the required text, and therefore they struggle classes they shouldn't necessarily struggle in. So I don't know if you heard that first one, but he said he waits until he's falling behind. Right? And I think that's what we're seeing. We're like, do I really need it? Uh-oh, I need it. Right? That's where they're at. Not purchasing one at all. And this is a, I've seen several studies now, one just that came out this morning actually from UMass Amherst, saying that about 60 to 70 percent of students say that they haven't purchased a required textbook. Sometime in their career. This doesn't mean every semester. That number is more like 30% every semester stay that they don't buy a required textbook because of the cost. Okay. I'm guessing you've seen that, right? Students who show up even like at the end of the semester who still don't have a book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. Oh. Hold on a second. One more video. This one's a little bit different. And this student talks about a number of strategies, including not buying the book, but he does talk about sharing it with. Um, others, sharing a textbook with others, and he talks about the impact of that. This is student at Carlson. Uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre-major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information system. I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking around and really asking people taking the courses uh, because I simply didn't afford it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative loans from my brothers, uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of, um, the tuition. And, um, so I, I have two other required textbooks. I'm sharing a third textbook between 
<laughs> two of my roommates and a guy down the hall. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's, and the other two, I just, I don't really worry about because, I mean, I don't have enough money for that right now, to be honest. But it, it becomes bothersome when you have to travel, you know, to another dorm just to read your own textbook. <laughs> Um, but I'd say for, I mean, there's some times where they're like, I, I need the book right now. I can't, I can't give it to you. And so I just kind of have to, um, twiddle my thumbs until late at night when they're done and then I can read the book and then either like get shorted on sleep or something. Like sometimes I've had to stay up as late as three, four or five AM and then go to sleep, get three hours, get up and go to class because I mean, that's when the textbook was available to me. A lot of times it's just you get shorted on sleep or you, you didn't have enough time to study as you want because I had to pass the textbook off to someone else that needed it. It's just kind of challenging because it's like, you know, it's you, you, you kind of, you're struggling to get enough money and it's always kind of the back of your mind to worry uh, throughout your day that do I have enough money to pay for my textbooks or pay my brothers back kind of thing. So it's, it's difficult. I might actually end up having to schedule my courses around what my roommates and people that I know are taking. Because if they have a shared textbook, then uh, I might have to take that class kind of thing. Because it's if it's something that maybe doesn't interest me, but it feel, fulfills a requirement or elective, I might have to take that because that's 200 less dollars in textbooks. Um, I'm so kind of stuck because I, I'm completely broke buying textbooks last year so I have to take out a loan and kind of manage which ones I'm going to buy and it's just kind of it always it always the second tuition I call it always kind of uh, surprises me just this past year I I've probably spent in the ballpark of a thousand dollars and I haven't even bought all of the required texts that they told me to buy it's been uh, yeah been difficult So do you hear some impact there about the sharing that he was doing? Um, what'd you hear? You get to doesn't the, work very well. Doesn't work again. Lack of sleep. Um, he's going to take classes that he may not even be interested in because he might be able to share the textbook. Right? But in a larger picture, like. Said textbooks don't excite me that much, but this is what gets me up in the morning. I mean, listen to his story. I mean, I still get broken. I was sitting in front of him during that interview, and I still, I've heard that dozens of times. It still really bothers me to hear that. Um, here's a student who does, who's done everything he possibly can do. <coughs> right? You hear that? He's had his full time job. He's got a full time job. He also was um, being paid to do, like, for medical, be a medical research subject. Um, he took out all the loans he could, which is why he had these alternative loans, he called them, from his brothers. Um, you know, like, what else could you ask someone to do? And, um, you know, so, I mean, he's, so he's finding ways to get by, right? <coughs> and not buying them and uh, sharing them. So. so what's the impact of all this, right? All of these kind of strategies that students are using is about an academic it, they're forcing themselves in a way, the cost is forcing them to have a, take some academic risk. This is a study that was, has, was done twice over the last four years, looking at that impact. Right? Not purchasing the book, like I said, between 60 and 70 percent. We've seen that. Taking fewer courses, about half of students are not taking a specific course because the textbook was too expensive. Running a poor grade, dropping course, failing a course. And there really is no institution in this country that should be okay with this, is there? If they really knew what this data said, that this was such a big impact on students. Besides the impact on the individuals, every institution has goals for retention and for your graduation rates and student success. So, <coughs> So you're depressed yet? <laughs> How did I do? That's yes. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I'm in curriculum and yeah. instruction, literacy studies, teach all online, et cetera, into the digital. Yeah. However, 
And maybe you can help with this, because I don't know the answer, and I brought it up, and no one knows. <coughs> um, so the National Council of Teacher Quality has a short list of mostly print t expensive textbooks that schools need to adhere to to not get an F on, I'm like paraphrasing, to not get you know an A through F stigma. Most schools have jumped through the hoops of creating syllabuses to adhere to their guidelines, even though they're not an accrediting body. Right. They just wreck havoc for, <laughs> I'm editorializing right. here. Yeah. But they're wrecking havoc and, and tarnishing images of schools of ed, and, and schools of ed are complying with that. How do we overcome that? <laughs> Our school of ed, where I am working, refused to comply, refused to respond to their requests. Okay, because we didn't. So if I'm an individual faculty member in that context, yeah. what can I do to yeah. embrace the issue within that, that right. constraint? Or like, I think other schools have not followed that path, but what do you recommend? I mean, I want to do all this, I'm gung-ho, right, right. I can't do anything. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a particular kind of technicality that is, right, especially specific to department colleges of ed, right? Because yeah. that's what they're focused on. Um, yeah, I, sorry, I don't think I can okay. tell you. I That's a, except to stop cooperating with them, which is what we did. But which doesn't mean they don't yeah. disparage us, because they did. I don't but, make decisions. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that, so, so let's, but that is kind of, I just wanted to spend, like I said, the first 20 minutes defining the problem, and that is the, right, is it pretty well defined now what the problem is? The question would be now, if we're going to start talking about solutions moving forward, um, how do we get these percentages down to zero? Right? How do we stop this? How do we not allow cost to impact students? What would be a solution that would, even if it seems unrealistic, what would be a solution that would solve this? Get all these down to zero. Free textbooks. Free textbooks would do it, right? Because then you can't say you failed because of cost, because there was no cost, right? So that would be the ideal solution. Um, wow, anybody here written a textbook? Uh, a test prep book. Test step. Can I ask you a couple questions about it? Yeah. Like, how long did it take you? Um, it was a revision of the book. So okay. Like six months. Okay, and that was for a revision, right? I, when I ask that question of textbook authors, like how long did it take you? It's usually one to two years for sure. Did you? Two and a half. Two and a half, yeah, okay. So um, it's a lot of work, true. Yep. It's a lot of work. Um, why would some, how do we end up with a free book then? Like, why would someone write one? Right, it seems kind of ideal, doesn't it? But it doesn't seem to match what motivates faculty, what the system is set up to motivate you to do. Right, as faculty. So, how do we end up? I'd like to show you how it's possible. And I, I'm going to, it is possible that you could end up with free textbooks. Okay, so bear with me for a second. Ready? It is possible. And, and to also respect the fact that it takes a lot of work and energy and time by faculty and expertise. Okay, so let's look at the publishing model. This is how publishing works. A really, really, really overly simple explanation of it. There's a publisher, they publish a book, and that takes an investment. It's probably a couple hundred thousand dollars, a, text, a textbook. A couple hundred thousand. They sell the book, the money goes back to the publisher, they recoup their costs, they make a profit, they have money to pay royalties to the author, typically in the range of 8 to 12 percent, maybe. I've heard between 1 and 12 from authors, right? So, something, but not a lot. And that's kind of how it works, right? Right, we all agree that's pretty overly simple, as I said. There's one other piece I'd like to throw on here, and that's copyright, right? I mean, copyright is important in this model. Why? Copyright restricts people, I mean, it's legally. Yeah, right, if, if you could copy it legally, do you think these students would pay for it? Right, so it's an important component to this, they would not. And they would kind of break this model, because if they didn't pay for it, the money wouldn't go back, they wouldn't invest in the first place, it would, it, right? So copyright's extremely important. It is in all of our academic work, right? Anything that we do is protected with this with copyright law, really, really important. All right, so that's the model. Let's look at a couple of other models that exist. They already exist. This isn't theoretical. This is, these are models that have developed textbooks, including some of them 
all of them actually, on the tables and sitting over there. Here's one. This is really overly simple. Somebody writes a textbook, probably for their own class. Right? They couldn't find something that they liked. They write one, and then they just put it out to the world and put it on the internet and say, here you go, anybody else want to use it, go ahead, and I don't care. That's probably, maybe, but probably not our future. Not a lot of faculty, I think, are willing to do that or have time to do that or need to do that, right? Because they can probably find textbooks that work for them, and they don't need to write their own. There are also maybe questions here. Some might say, has it been peer-reviewed? Is it of any quality? I don't, you know. I don't know, but I do, it's important to acknowledge that I know dozens of books that were written that way. Right? And they're out there. You can look at them and decide for yourself whether they're of any quality, but I need to acknowledge that. So here's the other model, though. This is the one that's growing. Again, kind of overly simple, but I think you'll get the point. What, what's new here? What did I add? Funder. Very important. The funder, right? So what's different here is that the money comes into this a little different way. Instead of coming from sales, it comes up front from a funder. And the funder says, the funder goes, says to the publisher, hey, you know what? We'll pay you up front to make this book. Under one condition, the book will be free forever. Right? You'll still get money, you still get paid, you can still pay the author some royalty, or not, not royalties, right? Royalties are based on sales, but you can still pay your author. So it's a little different that way, but the same effect. And so this is, this is a model that actually could, not only could exist, it's been, it's been out there for years, and this has been happening, where there are funders who have been Funding creation because of this problem with textbook costs has said, you know what, it's really important we get the cost down and getting it to zero is what we ideally want it to be. I recognize that you could say, you could put any problem up here on the screen and if you add a funder, say, okay, we're going to solve it with a funder. And that seems like a cop out. But the difference here is that it's been happening. And there are funders out there doing this. And primarily, the one that's growing the most are universities and colleges who are saying, are kind of taking ownership of this space and saying, you know what, this is important to the academic success of our students. We are going, we, our faculty are the ones writing these books anyway. Why don't we just fund the creation of, the, of a book or two? I mean, they're, they're expensive to make. So they're, they're not going to make like every book in the university, but if, if they just make a few, um, it'll help, right? And if all 4,500 institutions in the US or even a small fraction of those make a few, it'll make a difference. SUNY has made um, maybe a dozen or more. <coughs> Maryland back here has started the UMass Amherst project that has created a number. I don't know what that number is. Few, yeah. Only three or four so far. Yeah. Portland State has made, and uh, they're making about five per semester or so. so. And they have active kind of publishing programs that there's they're working on with their faculty on. And there's more and more and more and more. This is just a few small examples. Foundations have funded this. Um, the books that are hardcover in here, I think they're all hardcover, right? Yeah, like the stats book here, the, is that, what's that one? Calculus. calculus book there? Oh, a calculus book. I haven't seen that one yet. And there we go, this one. Those were made at Rice University and funded by the Hewlett Foundation and the Gates Foundation and a number of other foundations. Tens of millions of dollars poured into making textbooks. Right. Thanks, Jim. Um, governments have done some funding. The state of California funded the creation of about 50 of them. Um, the province of British Columbia has funded the creation of 60 of them. These books, in, um, and then there are consortium institutions like, um, do you have a law school here? No, no. Okay, well, any institution with a law school is a member of this organization in the country. Uh, CALI stands for Computer Assisted Learning and Legal Instruction. And they pool their money and they make textbooks. I think they, they make over 30 textbooks that they update every year with this consortial money that are used for legal instruction for law schools. And they need to update every year because laws change, right? <laughs> exactly. So, for instance, so here's one. This one's from Portland State. It's a GIS book. Here's a math uh, book from SUNY. 
Uh, here are the ones from Rice University, and their goal was to create um, textbooks for the 25 top enrolled courses in the country. These are the ones that were funded with the, the, the foundation funding. And they were almost there. I think they're up to 23 or 24 or something like that. And they're starting to come out with their second editions, like the sociology book. So you can see those are all kind of large enrollment courses. You see the kind of basic level large enrollment things. Here are the Cali books. You can see that the, the legal, legal instruction ones, you can see that they have years on them, right? This is an old picture of their website, but uh, they update them every year. So this model, again, isn't just like an ideal model, but it's actually out there and it's functioning. It's working and it's happening. It's growing. There's one piece of this that is missing um, that I need to add and explain. It's kind of a technicality, but it's really, really, really important, and that's this. Remember that copyright that I mentioned on the other one? Um, I just have a hard time kind of explaining this, but let me give it a shot. Like, if I were to say to you, here's a, here's a textbook, here you go, I'm going to hand it to you, um, let's say it's a digital textbook, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving it to you in a digital format, right? It's just, it could be paper, but let's just say digital, because I want you to try to copy it. I want you to copy it and give it to your students, because it was supposed to be free, right? They agreed on that. So you should just be able to give it away. That was the agreement. If I did that, if I sent you a thing and I said, here is a textbook that somebody made, you can use it, would you be, would you have any reservations to making copies of it and sending your students? I would. I mean, right? I mean, you'd be worried about breaking copyright law because they own the copyright, they published it, they have a, that's, any, anytime anybody produces any intellectual property, you, that person or uh, owns the copyright. So, even though copyright is extremely important, in this case, it isn't sufficient. If the goal is to kind of let people copy and share and do this, you know, for free, this book, then copyright is actually meant to do the exact opposite, right? It's trying to keep people from doing that. So, in this instance, copyright, is, like I said, isn't sufficient. What we need is something else. And that's where the Creative Commons comes in. And is anybody Familiar with it? A few people. Okay, good. Um, Creative Commons is a nonprofit founded uh, in uh, boy, I don't know, in the two just after the turn of the century um, by some of the country's brightest intellectual property lawyers. The whole mission of the Creative Commons is to create licenses for people who want to share intellectual property. So making it easier. So let's say that you have a traditional textbook and you want to make copies and give it to your students. What would you need to do? Traditional one. Get permission, right? Do you have a copyright clearance center here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you might have to co copy them or contact them, and they'll go work with the whoever owns the copyright, and they would, you know, call them up and say, "Hey, can I use this? And here's what I want to do." They would say, yeah, you give us this amount of money, we will give you a license to do whatever you're asking, right? They need to license, give you a license, so you know that, okay, I'm safe. They're not going to sue me for copyright. Okay, they're giving you documentation saying that. In this case, what the Creative Commons does is they give, they, they have all that documentation up front. They make licenses so that if... I write a book and I want people to share it and give it away for free and all that, I can put this license on the book. And then you as the end user know what you can do with it and then it's okay to share. You, it, that I'm basically saying that was the original intent, go for it, here you go. Don't worry about copyright, I can't sue you because I'm giving you this license, I'm, right? That's what a Creative Commons license is. It allows people to share, right? That's its whole point. So you often hear kind of copyright meaning all rights reserved. When there's a Creative Commons license layered on top of that, it means, okay, I'm kind of, I'm retaining some of those rights. It's still mine. I still made it. I'm still the copyright holder, but I'm going to allow you to do these things with it. So go for it. That's why I made it. Right? That's what that symbol means there, the CC. Right? It's not closed captioned. Uh, I think that's in a square, maybe. Creative Commons. What I mean. So if you see that, that's what this is. It means it's a license. And so that's actually the last piece of this model, is the book has to really to work, 
needs to have this license so that you as a faculty member are, can be comfortable doing what you want to do with it. A book with one of these licenses on it is called an open textbook. We finally got to the title of the presentation, an hour plus in. Um, that's what an open textbook is. It's a textbook that is, gives you permission to do things, like give it away for free. Plus, it also allows you to do some other things. This is kind of a bonus. So not only are these free, and we can address some of these affordability issues, but it also allows you to do these things. The licenses give you permission to do these, which are actually really cool and powerful things. You can make copies and you can share it, right? That's how you can distribute it for free. We've talked about that. You can edit it. You can mix it with other things. You can keep it forever so it's not a lease model. Most digital textbooks nowadays, you lose access after a certain amount of time. Not this. You have the rights to keep it forever. You can use it in your next class if you need to, you know, be reminded of what a derivative is. You can go back and look that up. You can use it for basically whatever you want. You're not restricting you on how you use it, generally. This is really powerful. This is what an open textbook is. It's a textbook where the author is, the copyright holder, gives you rights to do these things, right? So, see these? Have you seen these before? Anything look familiar? That's a, that's a license right there. And that's, that's a symbol representing the license. It's not the whole legal document license, but it's a symbol that will tell you what you can and can't do. There are six licenses that the Creative Commons makes. So they all kind of, they'll look similar to this, where you'll see the CC, which means this is a Creative Commons license. And then there are these little components. And you can see there are actually four components that get mixed into different licenses. So if you understand these four components, you'll understand all of these licenses. And the genius behind these Creative Commons licenses is, there are, I assume there aren't any lawyers in here, right? You don't need to be one to understand these licenses. You just have to understand what these symbols mean and then you're, you're pretty well covered. All right, you ready? We'll learn, and you can learn these in two minutes. And then there'll be a quiz. <laughs> so, first one. This one, with a little person on it, um, is the buy license or the attribution license, sometimes it's called, means that, um, okay, here's a book. You can do all of these things with the book that you want, but you need to attribute me. You need to say who it's by. So you can use it however you want, but you need to make sure my name is attached to it because darn it, I wrote it, right? Fair enough, right? And you notice actually all the licenses have that symbol on it. It's the most basic one, right? So all of these require that you say who this belongs to or who made it. That's fair. This one does not mean no cost, the NC. You see it's a dollar sign with a line through it. You know, any open thing could be free, no matter how it's licensed, because you have the permission to copy it and share it, right? What it means is, anybody know? Non Can't make money off it. NC means non-commercial. So you can use it to do all these things however you want. Use it, except they do put one limit on use. You can't make money from it. You can't, yeah, you can't make money off it. Which for faculty isn't like we don't sell our course materials to the students, right? I mean, we don't. So it isn't really a big issue. We're not making money on it. Whoops, I'm the wrong way. So that's uh, that one. Um, uh, it, what it actually means, it doesn't mean you can't sell it or make profit, it just means we're reverting back to, to the full copyright. If you want to sell it, give me a call, we'll work it out. Right? Yes? I noticed three of the licenses did not have that one on it. Right. So that's because the people who made like, like this license, if I made a book and I put that license, all I really care is that people attribute me. So as a the copyright holder, you have the choice of which license to use. So some people don't care if others make copies and sell it? Right, exactly. Yeah, I'll show you some examples, absolutely. 
Good observation. That's right. And and you'll see these are these licenses have a mix of all of these on, right? So this one, the SA. This is the most weird one. It's the one that people understand the least, and it's the most complicated one in a way, but let's bear with me on it. It means share alike. It means here's my book. You can do any of this stuff that you want, but if you change it, like edit it, or mix it with something else. In other words, if you make a derivative, if you make something new, a new work out of it, like let's say you translate it to Spanish. That's a new work. You've, you've taken my work and you've changed it somehow. You've edited it, right? If you do that, the essay component says that that new thing that you made has to use the exact same license that I used on my original one. So if, if this was my license right here, I made a book and I put this license on it. You took it, translated it to Spanish. You have to use this license on your Spanish version of the book. Does that make sense? If you change it or you add a chapter or you, all of that has to be licensed this way. It's kind of weird and you can get, go down some black holes with that one about like what if you did, but that's generally what it means. Right? And then this last one, um, MD means no derivatives. It's actually a component that many people would say is not really an open license because it says you can do all these things, except you can't really do all these things. You can't do these two things. You can't change it. No derivatives. You can't change my work. Here's my book. You can do all these things except those things. Right? You can copy it. You can give it away. You can use it for things. But you can't make a derivative. Okay? All right, here's a quiz. Right there. What that one mean? Here's my book. You can do all those things with it. But... Can't make, can't make money from it, Anne. You have to acknowledge me as the author, right? Exactly. All right, how about... Uh, there's a, this one right here. If it, do an attribution and non-derivative. Right. You have to attribute me as the author, and you can't change it. No derivatives. Right, pretty simple? Right? Isn't, that's what I love about these things. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand how to use them. So here's some examples. And the internet actually kind of runs off these licenses quite a bit. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah, a bunch. So right about, um, probably about 15 years now ago, the president of MIT said, hey, we're going to put all of our course content out on the web for free. Just opened up, right? It's just popular there. Um, this is a clip from the bottom of a page. Up above was a video of a classroom, like a faculty member doing an experiment, a like a physics demonstration. I used to teach high school physics, so it was a cool, something was exploding, and I don't know what it was, something, something, the kind of thing that students get excited about. I could take that video and put it in my course management system. What do you use here? Blackboard. Blackboard. You can put it in your Blackboard system and use it, but what do you need to do? Here's the license. Acknowledge that it's from MIT Open Courseware. That's an NC if you can't see that. They'll sell it, which we don't do anyway, so that's no big deal. SA. Share alike. So what does it mean? Right. If, the, if you make a derivative, you have to share it with that same license. Right? This same license right here. So if I took that video of the physics demonstration and I made a transcript of it, or I played music over it or something, I don't know, made a derivative, I changed it, I would have to license that new thing with this thing, by MCSA license, generally. TED Talks, we all know TED Talks, right? <coughs> if you look at the end of a TED Talk video, it goes by pretty quickly, but you can catch it. You'll see the license components on here, by... They don't, have a, they don't have a letter, so you have to, what's that one? Non-commercial, non and the last one? <clears throat> no derivative. So that means if you put this on your Blackboard site, this video, acknowledge Ted, which they do a pretty good job of already, <laughs> you need to, what? Not sell it. Not sell it, not make any money of it, and don't change it. So you can't even, you can't take a clip of it. That's making a new thing. That's a derivative. 
you can tell students to watch from one minute to five minutes, but you can't actually cut the video and put it on your website. And it's a new, that's a derivative. Why the TED organization decided that they didn't want you to change it, I don't know, but they get to choose. It's their intellectual property, right? Okay. Questions so far? That's a lot of kind of technical, legal legal stuff, right? I actually teach that to my students because they create multi multimedia <laughs> and they're forever just finding things on Google Images and then serving it. And the uh, worst yeah. part is because they teach online, I don't know what they do with it. Or I know less, and they'll take it back to their PD trainings that they're doing, and it's like, oh, I made this for UTA, and I don't follow copyright. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and so I, I teach them that because, for many reasons, but it, you know, it sort of reflects back on us. You know, oh, UTA doesn't know how to teach copyright. So I, I'm, I'm really strict about that image use, and it says goes, going beyond text. I want them to be, you know, good yeah. advocates for not stealing images. Right, and it's tough in today's age of access to any information you want on the internet and you know expecting you can just kind of grab it and not think about it it's easy to do technically yeah. from a legal perspective right it's important we teach our students that information so yeah kudos to you that's great and it could apply to anything right any intellectual property could have this a song a movie a book a play a artwork a poem whatever it happens to be right could have this on it and it's important to keep track and know. So that's why the reason that we're spending some time on this is because if you decide you're going to use one of these books, for this exact reason, you should understand what, you know, what kind of, what you're agreeing to in a way. I mean, it's simple, but it's important, right? These licenses. So, you know, when I, when I first started working on this, you know, what I heard from the faculty um, was that, like, okay, this sounds really good, but where do I find these books? They're kind of scattered around the internet and... You know, it's not like I, I know I can go to Pearson or McGraw Hill and I can just look up biology and pretty easy. So that's where this came from. Have you all been to this or seen this? It's part of the kind of thing. It was in, included in the invitation. Yeah, right. So if you haven't, it's at open.uman.edu. It's actually slash open textbooks, which gets you right to the, directly to this library. But we just put them in one place. So it's just as easy to find these books as it is to find a commercial textbook. You can look under. The subject areas, um, you can do a simple search um, if you're looking for books. There's, when we built this, I built this and it, it launched in April of 2012. Um, it had about 80 books in it, and now we're over 350. Like I said, it's growing very quickly. And um, the other reason we made this was faculty were asking an even more important question in my mind is, are these things any good? Like, that's the really most important question, right? If they're free, but they stink, like, what good are they, right? You don't want to use it, no matter what the cost is. So, um, we started collecting reviews <laughs> from faculty. We asked them to review the textbook, and we now have about 900 reviews. I just looked before we started here today. And, um, and it's growing really quickly. And there are reviews written by people like you. Right, and if um, and that's something we're going to talk about here in a bit. It's an opportunity for you. Um, your libraries here will actually pay um, a small stipend of two hundred dollars if you if it's something you choose to do. If you want to write a review from these books, we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's what the reviews have looked like so far. I just want to kind of throw out like when we made the library, I had no idea. As far as I knew, all the books were horrible. I can't judge it, right? My PhD is in education. I can't judge the biology book or the anything. But education, maybe. And here's what the reviews are looking like as of a couple days ago, which is very promising. It doesn't mean they're all good, and it doesn't mean they're all good for every situation, but at least it isn't a big red flag saying this is a bad idea. Right? There also has been in the last two years a number of studies. There have been a number of studies that are comparing open and non-open course content. So this is actually, these are slides actually CC by licensed uh, from researchers at Brigham Young University who sent them to me so I can share them here and you can have them if you want. Um, basically showing um, their, uh, a summary of their research of two studies. The first one here is a, it's a meta study of 13 peer reviewed studies on efficacy of, again, comparing open and non open. And um, 
you know, efficacy meaning the effectiveness. So they're actually looking at student outcomes here, which are what we're really interested in, right? Are these harming student out students? Are they failing? Are they are their grades worse? Are they, is the retention lower? All of that. They had about 120,000 students in these 13 studies, and what they found was open content resulted in 95% same or better outcomes. And this is a, you know, you always should look at research critically and think, does this make sense to me? This is one that does make sense to me. The other one I have some questions about. This one makes sense to me because why? Why would this, why do you think that maybe students on average would do better? They actually yeah. <laughs> Everybody has access to the book. Everybody can get it on day one, right? There's no waiting. There's no waiting until my financial aid check comes in. There's no, right? there's no excuse. There's no reason. It doesn't mean the law read it. But there's no financial barrier to that, right? So that would make sense to me. I get that. Right? Here's the other study. And it's, 12, it's, pure, it's, it's perceptions of quality. It's just asking them, what do you think about the quality of this material? Not actually looking at student outcomes. So they asked both faculty and students, about 5,200 of them, and this is what came out of it. Open, the same 50% of the time, 35% of the time they said it was better quality, 15% of the time they said it was worse quality. Sorry, you can't see that, it's worse. <laughs> right there. Um, this one, if I go on my common sense meter, I'm not sure why that would be the case. To me, it should be the same. I mean, it's just, I mean, there is a lot the same there. I don't know why they would say it was, they're just textbooks, right? They were funded differently. They are free, so maybe that's part of it, but yeah. I know in literacy, people like to follow certain gurus of the field, and if it's not written by a guru, it'll have less credibility. So that could be a reason why it's worse. And I mean, these are gurus, like huge followings. Do you mean, like, but these books typically don't have that, right? Yeah, so, I mean, in some fields, I think it's not so much the content, it's, yeah, the, it's right, the author. Yeah, right, the name of the author. Yeah, and so... So, so the open, that. then, by that reasoning, because I, I, I agree, I think yeah. that's how some of... Well, I mean, uh, then you would think it would be worse, right? Like, they would say open is worse with that, right? But they're not. They're actually saying it's better. I mean, I mean 35%. The only... Any, any theories on why that may be? Because I've heard a few... Why would they say? Why is it better? Yeah, why do you well, think they made it better? I've actually been to the Open Ed Conference and heard people from oh. BYU talk, but I think one reason was earlier access to the book. I don't know if it has okay. to do with the content, but outside of content, like have, just having access to the book, it you know the final might result in that. Yeah, is um you know huge. I just ha I have the book. That could be it. Yep. I don't know exactly. I mean, it's a meta study, so you don't know exactly how they ask the questions. Any other theories? Josh? I wonder if they're, <coughs> the constructors would be influenced favorably because they're aware that they could edit the content <coughs> to meet their student needs right. rather than that not being possible in their tradition. Yeah, or maybe they did edit it. So, so but yeah, that could be it. Freedom to edit it? Yes. Could be it. Even derived new examples from what they have given. Right. That could be it, yeah. In a, a software, the people that are discussing this with software say that it fosters a more peer reviewed mm. method of, of I, making your content. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would be the case here or not. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that um, some books that might be the case, maybe it's, maybe they are created more in the open, kind of like on GitHub or something with you know the, the, with software or whatnot. So yeah, I mean, but the thing that I take away from this is like there are no red flags here. Like people are not looking at this and going, these are horrible. We seem to be doing okay, regardless of why that is. So um, let's take a look at one book, and I want to show you this example for a reason. You know, hopefully see why. This is a physics, I don't know if we have this book in here. Do we have this one? No, physics book. But it's one of the Rice University, one of the hardcover ones in here. Um, it actually has a pretty large following. My understanding is that it's in the double digits as far as market share across the country. In introductory non-calculus physics. They're coming out with a calculus-based one too. But, so it's a two-semester book, 
It's 1,300 pages. It's about, it's a little thicker than that yellow one there. It's pretty, pretty long. You can get it in any of these formats. It's a PDF, as an EPUB. You can get it in print, like these are in print. And you can read it on the web if you want to. Right. Um, you, other than the print one, you kind of, you'd have a hard time getting this, these formats from a publisher, a, a commercial publisher, right? Because they don't want you to be able to copy things and share it, right? Because of what we talked about earlier. Um, so, I th um, one other thing that you can do that's really important is this Bookshare. Um, Bookshare is a service online, and I do forget whether it's bookshare.net or .org, but you can go there. You can upload content in a number of formats, and what it will push back to you are accessible formats. So a Braille printer format, a DAISY format, which is used for screen readers, and, and things like that. So you can, because this content is open and out there and not locked down, <coughs> you, can, you can do that. You could not do that with a commercial textbook. You'd be, if you tried, you'd be breaking copyright law, and it wouldn't work anyway. There's an instructor solution manual. I noticed there's a solution manual for this. What book is this? Economics? Yeah. The economics book here, and here's the appendix and appendices and the answer key here, right? And so you can get those. You can get them digitally, or you can get a print copy of them. Um, they are generally not out there on the open web. You typically will have to email um, OpenStax. Is that right, Michelle? And they'll, or that just came with. Oh, because you ordered, yeah, okay. If you're an instructor, you, I think what you generally do is email them. They kind of confirm that you're, you are an instructor, and then they'll send you the digital link to it. I think that's how it works. So, um, And you can get PowerPoint slides. And the other thing that they've done is they have partnered with a whole bunch of little companies that make things like um, quiz banks and things that are aligned with the book. So those kind of ancillary services, they've done, and it might cost you something to do that because these are companies they've contracted with, but they're there if you want them, and it's not going to cost the same. Um, the print book, by the way, can you see the price on the back of that yellow one? Thirty-three fifty. Thirty-three fifty. So, so you have to pay something if you want a print copy, of course, right? I mean, you're paying for paper and ink; you're not paying for the intellectual properties. Um, but it tends to be about 20% of what a commercial book of that size would be. So what would that be? That would be like, would you say 30 so $150 or so? Yeah, yeah. Right, that would be at least $150, though, I guess. I think the physics book's about $45. <laughs> right, yep. So, um, so the point of this, the reason I wanted to show you this book in particular, and there are a lot of them that are like this, is that oftentimes, because they're free, the assumption is there's no ancillary, there's nothing else, it's just a book, and I can't use that. For some of, some of the books, that's absolutely true. For some commercial books, that's absolutely true. But all I'm saying is that you gotta go look. You just have to go look to see what they, these books have. Because right? some of them have a lot. You'd be surprised. So, I wanna share with you, kind of before we wrap up here, um, some examples, um, we've talked about the big problem that we're trying to address when I got you depressed in the first 20 minutes, which is this affordability thing, which we can address with these books. But there is this extra, there's a frosting on the cake, which I'm actually, um, as someone who's in the field of education, more interested in, not more interested, at least as interested in, as the affordability part. And it's the rights that you have as an instructor to do something with the book and make it work better for your students. So I want to give you three examples of some faculty that I know that have taken these books and changed them, used those rights that you're given. Right? So here's the first one, and it's, it's not much to look at, but this is the cover page for a collaborative statistics book, which was written by uh, uh, someone at a couple of uh, community college and faculty in, in California. And this book is now used in many, many classrooms. It's an open collaborative, very, very low level statistics book um, for just the most introductory low level stats book that you can find, really, for people who are not at all interested in stats, right, who, who, but need to take it. Um, 
So faculty at Minnesota uh, adopted this, three faculty, and because of the level of this course, they teach it with Excel. Right? It's a tool that, that uh, anyone could, much easier than R or SPSS or, right? So it, it makes sense to be using it in this course with these students. They wanted to, they used this book for a year. And then they said, you know what, we want to make it better. We want to fit the tool. We want examples and we want how-tos and we want all that fit in there. So they actually edited the book. They added about a thousand multiple choice questions. They, in every section, they added some kind of little call out about Excel, like here's how you do it in Excel, or here's, you know, here's, let's explain this function in Excel. And you can see on the title page here, um, I believe this book was CC by licensed, which means what? Absolutely. Yep, you acknowledge here, you attribute the original author. So here's the new title page. It says collection editors, and these are the three University of Minnesota faculty. And then it says authors, and it lists all five of them, the two original and the three new ones. And I know Barbara Olowski, who's one of the original authors, and she is like thrilled. Every time she sees me, oh, University of Minnesota, yay. Like, you took my book and made it awesome, and, right? <laughs> no one, it's possible that no one else will use that book. But it was perfect for these three faculty. They made it exactly what they needed it to be. And Barbara loved that. That's why she wrote it. That's why she put it out there with the CC BY license, right? Um, the faculty member who adopted this, um, he he was trying to help his students who were getting stuck in problem sets, right? It's algebra, lots of problems to do, lots of drill. And so what he did was actually a fairly simple thing: is that he made dozens of videos. Just on his laptop, little kind of like PowerPoints with a voiceover, right? And you probably, pretty much any campus has access to that technology where you can make a voiceover PowerPoint thing. He did that and he put links in the book and each problem set that basically said, are you stuck? Click here. And basically it will open up a YouTube video where he explains how to do those specific problems. What a simple and kind of amazing, you know, just in time support kind of a thing to do. Um, and it didn't take him very long to do. I mean, he was pretty technically able. Or, I mean, you know, he was he was pretty, pretty at ease with the technology, but it really wasn't hard. Here's an example of one of his videos. Um, you'll have to excuse the browser that he added to the front of it. <laughs> Adding and subtracting vectors. You should be familiar with the Cartesian coordinate system Just a power and fly vectors. So, and he, in this lesson, we will define some basic properties of vectors we'll learn about vector. and learn how to add vectors, <laughs> subtract vectors, and scale vectors. That is, to make vectors longer or shorter without changing their directions. So a lot of these slides he already had, right? I mean, he uses them during class and during lecture, and he just kind of repurposed them, put them together, and made it work silver for them, right? Pretty, pretty simple and easy. Here's the last example. Um, and this is a course taught at Brigham Young University by David Wiley, who David Wiley is kind of the father of open education. He's a, a, a leader in this field of, of studying open education and the impact on it. He has the same background I do, kind of ed tech. Um, and so he was teaching this class called Project Management for Instructional Designers. And there is no textbook for that specific thing. Um, at least there wasn't. Because what he did with his class, these, are, these were master's degree students, is he spent a semester taking an open project management book and making it a project management for instructional designers book. So they edited the book, the students did, during the semester, took out changed examples that were maybe about business exam, business uh, you know projects or construction projects or different kinds of projects, and made them about instructional design. Um, when they were all done, they had a new book. They had a derivative work. They put it out there on the web. If you want it, it's at pm4id.org. All of his students are now authors. They all have author credit. Isn't that awesome? I mean, is that not what we kind of aspire to for our students, is that they start creating the knowledge? Mm -hmm. This is exactly what they did. 
And then every semester he has students go through and do some an improved book. So I think one semester they went and aligned the book to, this is my understanding, aligned the book to uh, like project management, like national standards or something like that. Another semester they went out with and, and recorded on video um, instructional designers, questioning them about their project management practices, and then linked to those within the book. All of those students are now authors. Right? So pretty impressive. Uh, David calls this open pedagogy. And he says he does it, he did it to get rid of throwaway assignments, what he would call. He says if you, you know, ask students to turn in an assignment, you grade it, you throw it away. This is a permanent impact they're having on the world. Their name is out there. Um, uh, and it's pretty cool. So those are some, just three simple examples of, of, of things. There are many other ones that, that faculty decided to do. Um, I want to put a bit of a caveat out there. It doesn't mean it was easy to do, right? I mean, there, there is work that, to edit a book. It's the technical expertise that's needed, um, and it takes time and it takes energy. You can adopt a book and not do any of that. Most of the faculty I know who adopt these books use it as is. Perfectly fine. Um, it's really a handful that I know that if you, they maybe use it for a year and then they start digging into it and going, you know what, we can make this better. I hate more than a handful, but not the majority. I'm saying that because it, like, I understand that that is work. I don't want that to sound like a barrier for you to actually like look at these, like, oh, this is going to be a lot of work. You don't have to do any of that if you don't find you have the time or that there's a need. Um, um, I'm forgetting the point I wanted to make there. Oh, I know. It was actually that even if you, you know, you heard those students earlier kind of complaining a little bit about students, they only use one or two chapters of the book, and they, right, they were complaining about that. If the book is free, they couldn't care less how many chapters you use, right? They're not buying it. That's the problem. That's the complaint they have. We spent $300 on it, and they only use a couple chapters. If it's free, and you only want to use a couple chapters, you don't have to edit it. You don't have to, like, just use it. They're not going to complain about that, right? It's the cost impact they're having. So, here we go. Here we go. Um, somebody told me once, if you give a presentation and you don't ask people to do something, then you've wasted your time and theirs. <laughs> right? So, here we go. I'm going to ask something from you. What can we do? I mean, as faculty, what can we do about this? And it's pretty simple, and we're not asking a lot. But just simply take a look. Look at the library. Look to see if there's something. Write a review. We'll talk about that in a minute, about what that looks like and what the opportunity is there. Adopt it if it meets your needs, if it meets the needs of your students. Please don't adopt it if it doesn't. Right? Um, and then raising awareness is something else that you can do that could really make a huge impact. Um, the example I always use is a workshop I gave about maybe three years ago at Purdue, and a, a math faculty member came to a workshop like this, went back, she teaches uh, pre-calc and calculus at Purdue, which is an engineering school, so there are a ton of calculus students. Um, she convinced all of her colleagues said, let's do it. Let's flip all of our classes, make, make and use open content. And she now saves, because of her actions, saves, Purdue is now saving their students a million dollars a year on those textbooks. Just that, just those two courses. Maybe it's like a Calculus 1 and Calculus 2 or something like that. A million dollars a year. Um, the slides that I'm using right here have a CC BY license on them. You are welcome to them if you want to just point people to them or whatever, raise awareness in your department and talk about it. Um, so let's talk about writing a review. Um, if there's something in the Open Textbook Library, you know, if you've looked there, you, you, you know now, um, the libraries here will pay you $200 as a stipend to show kind of their, uh, you know, respect your time that it took to do these two things. You have to have done these two things. So number one, check. Number two, write a short review, right? Here's what it would look like for writing a review. And I'll pull up um, a re some reviews and we'll take a look at some to see, you know, what is expect would be expected. 
you will receive, because you are here today, you will receive an email from me in the next week or so, sometime next week. It'll be from me, Dave Ernst. Don't forget that name, so you don't throw it in your trash. Complete a concise report, and we'll show you by concise what I mean by that, but it, it, basically you're not writing a, this isn't a book review that if you've done, if you've reviewed textbooks before or books before, this is meant to be not that. This is meant to be something we're going to put on the Open Textbook Library to be very short and concise and give people just the first look. Okay. The deadline is March 24th. So, what are we, about six weeks out? Um, when's your spring break? April? Yeah, uh, mid-March. Oh, mid-March. Sorry, I might ruin your spring break. Okay, anyway, no, the review will be posted on the Open Textbook Library. It will it will have an open license itself, and if that's a subject you have questions about, we can talk afterwards, I'm happy to talk about it, I don't want to make a big deal out of it. But the main point is that there are other initiatives that are very interested in collecting faculty's perspectives on these books as well. And we'd be, like to be able to share those. Um, for instance, right now we are actually been talking to the Ministry of Education in British Columbia. They're, they want to know, they're trying to do the same thing and raise awareness in, in their province. And then after that, uh, the stipend will be paid. Let's just kind of take a look then at it. So here's the Open Textbook Library. Is this long enough? Yeah. Um, let's find, uh, I don't know, Natural and Physical Sciences. All right, this one has, wow, 22 reviews, Anatomy and Physiology. We have that one here. Um, so let's look, here's what the review will ask you about. Here there are 10 different criteria that we'll look at. Comprehensiveness, accuracy, longevity, clarity, consistency, modularity, organization, interface, grammatical errors, and cultural relevance. And there'll also be an area where you can say anything else that you feel like you weren't asked but were maybe is important, including like, for instance, this book that I happen to be on, Anatomy and Physiology. I have had a few faculty say, I want to write a review, but I only teach anatomy. I'm only, I would only use half the book. And I said, go ahead, just make sure you comment at the end that this is who I am, this is what I teach, and, I, and my review only applies to this. It's messy, but um, it's, 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 so any context like that that you have, right? Maybe the course or whatever, whatever you think is important. So let's take a look at some so you get an idea of what they might look like. So here's one written uh, by someone from the University of Oklahoma. So each section has a numerical 1 through 5 rating. See that there? And a space for you to kind of express what you think about it, give, give your opinion on it. All right. I would say this is a Pretty, well, I was going to say pretty average, but it's like a couple of these are longer than average, those two. And a couple of the rest of them are, I would say this is probably an average size that I see. That said, I don't care how long it is. Like, that's not the point. The point is that you give whatever feedback you think someone like you would like to have. It is not expected that this is a complete review of every detail of the book. This is a first look. This might help someone understand whether this book, they might want to look further into this book, right? Does that make sense? It's just, let's look at another one. Let's look at this one. This is also, oh, University of Oklahoma. Here we go. Please keep in mind that I'm only reviewing the physiology portion of this book. This is pretty average. Questions? Not, not a big lift. It really, I'll be completely transparent about why we're asking you to do this and why the libraries is asking you to do you know, offering this to do, to do this. Number one, it helps to have these in the library so that you know what your peers or your peers know what their peers think about these books. It gives them some, some honest look at the book. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. The other is, again, I'll be completely transparent about this. Like, Getting you to stop your busy, busy, busy faculty lives and just stop and take a look at this is important. Because if you're like me, 
you'll come to a workshop like this and you'll go, that is a really great idea. Okay, I'm going to go back to work. Right? <laughs> you get back to your office and you get back to work. And you kind of go, that was a really great idea. I really should do something. This is really, we're trying to just say, you know what? Well, we're going to, we're going to try to respect your time by you know, paying you a little bit, of, but we, we understand it takes a little bit of time and please do it and follow. So it's something that will live on after the workshop. If you want these slides where they are, Slide share, you can download them there. I have enough, I will upload these specific ones right now. And they'll be there. You can download them. They won't have the videos in them because they're too big. But uh, there'll be links to the videos if you want to. Thank you all for coming.